Tonight we're going to embark on our journey of the Old Testament prophets. There's uh, 15 prophets, 16 if you count the book of Lamentations, which is really a book of poetry uh, written by the prophet Jeremiah, which is why it gets tagged to the end of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, and the prophets range from um, 800 BC to about 400 uh, BC. In fact, the second page in your outline, um, my assistant Jonathan, and you can thank him later, um, I, I said, I want to put, I give everyone a, a map uh, or a timeline of all the prophets and where they fall. And he actually made this from scratch. Um, so anyway, just, he's, he's a good egg. And um, so you can thank him for that later. But the prophets uh, fall into four categories. So just to get started on our outline, um, there are the prophets to the northern kingdom. That would include the prophets Jonah, Joel, Amos, Hosea, Micah, uh, and Isaiah were all prophets to the northern kingdom. Um, after the fall of the northern kingdom, Isaiah started preaching to the southern kingdom because, you know, what, are you, what else are you going to do? Um, there's also the prophets, number two, the prophets to the southern kingdom. Southern kingdom of Judah, that includes uh, the prophets Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Jeremiah were the primary prophets to the southern kingdom. Number three are the prophets in the Babylonian captivity. There were three, and that is there was Daniel, um, Ezekiel, and um, Obadiah. Obadiah is a one-chapter postcard of a prophecy um, to a, uh, the nation of Edom, uh, which is modern-day Jordan. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll talk about them next week. And then number four are the prophets in the return to Jerusalem. These are, uh, these are the post-captivity uh, prophets. And uh, these are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's uh, those, those three. So, but all the prophets are prophesying at different times for different reasons. And this is why uh, to really understand the prophets, you really have to understand when they were around who they were prophesying to, and, and because it really gives you color and background as to why God called them and what God called them for. And uh, so uh, the last thing I want to say by way of introduction is that this section that we're going to cover tonight is what are called the major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, and then tagged in their Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel. Those are the major prophets. The other 12 that we'll cover next week are called minor prophets. Um, not because of their, uh, they are called major prophets. And I know we kind of look at that like, you know, the major prophets are like the big leagues. And then the minor prophets are the guys that, you know, they're still testing out their material. You know, that, that's, not, that's not how it is. Uh, the major prophets are called major prophets because their books are humongous. Um, they are prophesying for a long period of time, and uh, their books are generally larger. Uh, the minor prophets are called minor because their books are, ten, are relatively shorter. Um, the other thing that's important to note is uh, in 1947, the world was blessed to find uh, what was called the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a collection of writing by a mysterious group of people called the Essenes, uh, the Essenes lived in an area in southern Israel near the Dead Sea that was called Qumran, uh, this area of caves there, which I've had the pleasure of going to. Uh, they wrote extensively. The Dead Sea Scrolls primarily are about Jewish life um, in the, um, you know, around the first century. Um, and they also had scrolls of uh, books of the Bible. Many people believe that John the Baptist was an Essene, um, which is possible. We'll talk about that in two weeks when we get to John the Baptist, and we'll spend a good amount of time. There's an excellent book out on John the Baptist, by the way, uh, written by someone. But anyway, good stuff. Anyway, uh, but some people believe that Jesus wasn't a scene uh, because Jesus's imagery at times matches that of the Essene community of light and dark. Uh, a lot of things that we see like in, in uh, 1 John, you know, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. These are all things that, that were talked about in the Essene community. I don't believe Jesus was an Essene um, nor do I believe John the Apostle uh, was, was in a scene. But anyway, we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about the influence that they had in John the Baptist's life. Um, but the most important thing that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls was a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It was found in its entirety, dated at 200 B.C. So this is a scroll that is essentially 2,200 years old. 
And uh, people expected when they saw this and began to examine it, that there would be a lot of changes based on the Isaiah scrolls that we have today and the translation that we have today into English. And what they found were that these things were identical. In fact, what they found were they were identical minus six changes. And the six changes were literally just punctuation issues like dotting of I's, crossing of T's. That's what that's literally the only differences that they found. Um, uh, so I, I saw the Isaiah scroll when I was in Israel in 1999, and uh, there's this beautiful exhibit at the, um, at the Jerusalem Museum uh, called the Shrine of the Book. In fact, I think I have a picture of the Shrine of the Book here. Uh, this is made to look like the top of a scroll. You come around the other side, and uh, that's the entrance to it. This thing is totally climate controlled. You even touch the glass, an alarm is going off, and someone from the Israeli Defense Force, um, which if you haven't seen these guys, it is the, it is the most interesting thing to see um, men and women that you have to serve. If you're, if you're a boy, you serve two years in the Israeli Defense Force. If you're a girl, you serve one year. You have to be in your fatigues and you have to carry your American M16 at all times. So I remember I was in line at a coffee shop um, in Jerusalem and the girl in front of me was in her fatigues with her M16 on her back. And so, and I felt safe. Um, so, I like to see that. Uh, you know, there were no conceal and carry issues because I don't know how you conceal an M16. Uh, so, anyway, but the entire Isaiah scroll is on display and you can look, it's really a breathtaking experience um, to see it. So let's get into the book of Isaiah. So if you want to turn the page, you can. Um, Isaiah is about, uh, the theme of Isaiah is the salvation of God. Uh, the salvation that God provides to uh, his people and all who would call on him. Um, Isaiah is called the Messianic prophet because Isaiah talks so much about the coming Messiah. He talks um, about the Messiah in his first coming, uh, like in Isaiah 52 and 53, uh, the suffering servant that um, exactly depicts the crucifixion. Um, and then it talks a great deal about the Messiah in his second coming. Um, Isaiah is called the mini Bible uh, because it actually breaks the same way the Old Testament and the New Testament break. The Old Testament has 39 books. The Isaiah, the, kind of the historic section of, of Isaiah is at 39 chapters. And then the New Testament, obviously 27 books. The last 27 chapters of Isaiah speak of the future, the coming of the Messiah and the coming kingdom of God. Um, Isaiah's ministry happens from uh, about 750 B.C. to 695 B.C., right around there, which means that he saw the northern kingdom of Israel go into captivity in 722 when the Assyrians uh, took them over. Um, and after they went into captivity, Isaiah moved to the southern kingdom and continued uh, to prophesy uh, to the southern kingdom. The name Isaiah means salvation is of the Lord, and it's very apropos because that's the theme of his book. Um, Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament. Um, in fact, I want to show you, and this is just, I just find this so fascinating. Um, so I want to read you a passage from Isaiah, uh, and then I'm going to read you a passage of how, I, how Jesus quotes Isaiah in, in Luke chapter 4. So this is Isaiah chapter 61. He, um, Isaiah writes, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who, are, who mourn in Zion, and to give them beauty for ashes, and oil for j the joy of, of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now that is the whole passage, Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 3. It is a messianic passage um, to begin with. We, and then what puts the exclamation point for us to be totally aware of why it's a messianic passage, because Jesus quotes it, saying, hey, this is about me, by the way. Um, and so let me read to you from the passage in uh, Luke chapter 4. It says, so he came from Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and when he was handed the book, he found a place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, period. And then he closed the book, gave it to the attendant, and sat down. And all of the eyes were on uh, who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, there's a lot here, but I, one of the things, the thing that I want to note is that he, Jesus puts a period where there is a comma in the original text. He says that to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma, and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, period. Now, why? Because Isaiah was seeing the whole picture first and second coming of Jesus. Jesus shows up in his first coming and he says, this is what I'm going to do at, at, at this time. And then later on, um, and he sets out in, in his mission, but this gets into the whole idea of um, one of the things that you'll find as you read the Bible, especially the prophetic books, there's what's called near and far fulfillment, uh, where God, there will be a prophecy that's given and it will be something that's going to happen in the future. But then there will be something that happens in the moment, like in the lifetime of the person that it's spoken to, so that you say, well, it's, it, you know, there's something that's going to happen here that's going to show that, what, that this is really true. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, um, but that, I think this is one of the places where it does that, where there's actually, well, this wouldn't be near and far. It would be kind of far and farther um, to where Isaiah sees the, the, the ministry of the Messiah um, in his first coming and in his second coming, that God is going to do all of these things, but simply at different times. Um, uh, Isaiah is uh, Isaiah is a special book for me because it was a required book in college, and so I wrote several papers um, on on the book of Isaiah, different chapters um, that I had to do um, exegesis on um, and all that. But you know, Isaiah is a fascinating book. Um, so you get into um, the first couple chapters of Isaiah is just his his prophesying against the people of Israel. Um, and he says, you know, to them, like, you know, behold, uh, beware of, of those um, who call uh, good evil um, and evil good. And that's just one of the things that he's telling the people of Israel in the first five chapters, like, you have it all wrong. And you think you're doing okay. You're not doing okay. This is a disaster, and it's not going to end well. Um, in chapter six, Isaiah has a vision um, of God, the throne of God. And it's very picturesque and, and, uh, and, and all that. It's, it's really amazing. Um, he gets a glimpse of the incarnation of Jesus in chapter 7 and chapter 9. Um, Isaiah's prophecy about Cyrus uh, letting Israel return to the land in chapter 45 is there. Uh, Isaiah sees the crucifixion in uh, chapters 52 and 53. And then he gets a glimpse of the second coming in chapter 63 and of the millennium in chapter 65 and 66. Um, to just cover that for Isaiah is an absolute crime, but there is so much more to cover, so we're going to move on uh, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's theme um, is the judgment of God. Um, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet uh, because, he, uh, the, because um, his, of his authorship of Jeremiah and of the book of Lamentations, which we'll cover shortly. Um, he is so grieved over the rebellion of the people of the southern kingdom of Judah. And even though they saw Israel swept away, um, they still, they, they realized at a slower rate, but they were continuing down that same road. And so he saw the rebellion. He saw the coming judgment of God. Um, and you see that like in chapter 25 when he says, um, uh, which is really a strong thing, Jeremiah prophesies to the people and God says that Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. Uh, who's doing my will. And they're like, he's not your, he's the enemy. He's the bad guy. And he's saying, no, the judgment is coming from me. God is saying to the people, and Nebuchadnezzar is just the vessel that I'm using to execute my judgment. And that was, you can imagine how that went over. Um, you know, people trying to kill Jeremiah and all this. And uh, Jeremiah is a very fun book to read. Um, I mean, it's sad, but as far as the prophets go, it, the book moves quickly and um, it says in uh, Jeremiah 13, as far as why is he the weeping prophet, it says, but if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Um, Isaiah prophesies for about 40 years in the southern kingdom of Judah. And from what we can tell, there is not one person 
who turns from their ways at the preaching of Jeremiah. So not one convert uh, that he has. It's a lonely ministry that Jeremiah has uh, doing what, what God wants of him. Um, the, uh, the book of Jeremiah divides itself nicely. Um, it divides itself into three sections. Uh, there are the prophecies before the fall of Jerusalem, and that's in chapters 1 through 39. Uh, there are the prophecies after the fall of Jerusalem, which is uh, chapters 44, uh, 40 to 44. And then there are the prophecies upon the Gentile nations, which is chapters 45 through 51. And there's chapters 50 and 51 are totally dedicated to uh, the fall of uh, Babylon. And so you can read that. Um, Isaiah 13 and 14 are dedicated to the fall of Babylon. Uh, Revelation 17 and 18 uh, are dedicated to the fall of Babylon. So one thing we know is it ain't going to end well for the Babylonians. Um, and so um, Jeremiah is not just a prophet. Jeremiah is a patriot. He is a guy who loves uh, Israel. He loves the kingdom of Judah, and his heart breaks to see the people of Judah walk away from the Lord. In, in Jeremiah chapter 9, it says, Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. And so the theme of Jeremiah is that God is going to punish, but that God will also restore. Um, you know, in, in the last like 20 years or so, uh, Jeremiah 29 11 has become like such a popular verse, you know, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, um, which is great. I love that verse, and, and I believe it's true, but um, sometimes we just pull it out of its original context. Uh, the, let me read you the original context, and it'll give you a different flavor for what, what's happening. In Jeremiah 29, this is verses 10 to 14. It says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And then I will call, you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather uh, you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. The idea is, and the thing that, that Jeremiah is saying is, there is going to be judgment upon the nation. But afterwards, God is going to do good to the people. There's going to be 70 years of captivity, and then they're going to be able to go home. That's the good that he has planned for them. And this is an important passage. Um, it, really, uh, this section um, of Jeremiah 29, because um, in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, the, the Bible says that Daniel is reading the Bible. And it's always good when the Bible characters are reading the Bible. Um, and so, but it says, uh, well, let me, I put it in your notes. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, in the lineage of the Medes, who was made kingdom over the realm of the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans are the Babylonians, um, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So at, towards the end of the 70, uh, 70 years, uh, Daniel is, is coming to, he's like, man, I'm reading Jeremiah, which by the way, these things were not easy to come by, um, but he gets a scroll, a Jeremiah scroll, and he reads it, and he's like, it's 70, it's 70 years, and it's coming to an end. And then um, this gets him to the place where at, at this time, he starts praying. And he's like, God, if, it's se if the 70 years are up, what are you going to do now? And that is what causes him to get um, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And we covered that a little bit um, uh, a couple, couple weeks ago, the whole, um, you know, 173,880 days and all that. <clears throat> we talked about that in the book of Nehemiah because the order to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was the start of that clock, which leads us then to um, the day of the triumphal entry, or we call Palm Sunday, uh, which I, I believe this is probably one of the most astounding prophecies in all of Scripture. Okay, um, let's talk about the book of Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations is a song of Jerusalem's destruction. 
Um, Lamentations is not a book of prophecy. It's, as much as I said, it's a book of poetry. Um, it is the eyewitness account of Jeremiah watching the people of Judah be carried away by the Babylonians into captivity. Uh, it's a collection of five poems. There's uh, five chapters. Each chapter is one poem. Um, uh, Lamentations is, is really a remarkable work of poetry because uh, the first four poems are an acrostic. And so um, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet start each sentence. And so, you know, if we were reading it in Hebrew, it would be a lot more impressive. But because we're reading it in English, we kind of lose that. Um, but so they're used kind of, you know, each letter is used in succession. But every year, uh, the book of Lamentations is read on the 9th of Av. Uh, that's one of the Hebrew months. Um, by the way, the 9th of Av falls on August 1st this year um, to commemorate the destruction of the temple. Three weeks before the 9th of Av, uh, which is called the 17th, the 17th of Tammuz, which is the month before that in the Hebrew calendar, um, they, they start this three-week period that ends on the 9th of Av, which is the destruction of the temple. Um, it's called uh, uh, the... the uh, Bain Ha uh, Metzarim. And the uh, Ha Metzarim are called the days of distress. And um, now, if you're wondering, like, if that's August 1st, what day? Are we? So today, is, at, at, once it became nightfall, it became the 26th of Tammuz. So we're actually in that three week period right now. Um, and so, and, and, and the reason it's called the days of distress is because of the first chapter of Lamentations, which says this, I put it in your notes. It says, Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors have t over uh, overtake her in dire straits. And that's that same phrase, um, the days of distress, dire straits. Um, the thing that makes the ninth of Av so um, sad in Jewish life is that because that is the day that Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed the city. And, uh, that was his third siege of Jerusalem. The first was in 606 BC, um, and that's when he took, you know, Daniel and all those guys. The second siege was in 597 BC, and that's when he takes the next guy we're going to look at, Ezekiel. Um, and then the third siege is when he destroys the temple. He destroys Jerusalem. He destroys the walls. Everything gets wiped out. And that was on the ninth of Av. Now, the thing that's fascinating to me is that when the second temple is destroyed, um, by uh, Titus and the Roman 10th Legion um, in 70 AD. It is destroyed on the 9th of Av. Both temples were destroyed on the same day. So this is um, a day of mourning. It's a day of fasting. Um, it, it's not only that, but they do anything um, to not have to say, uh, the, they do nothing joyful, so they, they don't have to say uh, the, this, this Jewish blessing of, you know, that God has blessed us because we do this because it's a day, it's, it really is a day of reflection and mourning and God's judgment on the people. Um, so, all right. Um, we're we're going to spend the bulk of our time uh, tonight and I, I've, you know, at least the rest of our time in Ezekiel and Daniel because it's just so important as we look at uh, not just the history of the Bible and the timeline of the Bible, but also as we look at the future and what God has planned in the future. Um, Ezekiel is about the glory of God. And uh, that is one of the themes of Ezekiel, is that uh, Ezekiel gets these heavenly visions of the, the throne of God, of what heaven looks like. Um, Ezekiel, as I mentioned, was taken to Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's second siege of Jerusalem in uh, 597. Um, so Ezekiel is a very, um, it is a strange book at times. It's a very difficult book. Um, and I'm just being straight up with you, you know, just, that's so easy. You know, it really is a tough book. Um, I have been studying Ezekiel personally, my, from my own, just my own personal studies um, for about a year and a half. And I'm, I'm maybe through the first 20 something chapters. Um, and this is, this isn't like, oh, you just like read it. No, this is like, I'm reading books, studying language. Oh, I'm really digging into it. Um, and, and so uh, it's a fascinating book. It's, very, it's, it's a very peculiar book in, in many ways. Um, but, and because Ezekiel is a very colorful prophet, um, God has him act out his prophecy. So like in, in chapter 4, um, he tells Ezekiel, I want you to get a clay tablet. So he gets a clay tablet. And he says, I want you to draw a picture of Jerusalem. He draws a picture of Jerusalem. He says, now I want you to take um, an iron plate. And I want you to put the plate right next to the, uh, the clay plate 
that is a picture of Jerusalem. And then I want you to build these mounds around it. I mean, so it's like, you know, he's building all this stuff. Like when people are, you know, he's, he does this like in the open and people are like, what is this crazy guy doing? Um, and so, and it's all of this is to depict that Israel, that, that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed um, and, and that God's judgment will be on uh, Jerusalem. And so now the thing that's interesting to understand is that Jeremiah and Ezekiel were the only prophets telling the king um, at the time and uh, were telling the people to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, they were saying that, as I mentioned earlier, that Nebuchadnezzar was an instrument of God's judgment and to simply accept and not resist what God was doing. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 10 give us a vision of the throne of God. The angels are pictured to have um, the faces of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, the face of an eagle. Now, if, you're, if you've been with us uh, from the beginning, you're like, oh, that reminds me of the encampment of the children of Israel, that, that was, those were their banners. Well, that's because, if you remember um, the study of that in, in the book of Hebrews, that everything that was done in the tabernacle was to be a copy and a reflection of what heaven looks like. So if you want to know what heaven looks like, study the tabernacle, and it'll tell you exactly uh, what, what heaven is like, what the throne of God looks like. So, and you see that consistently in Numbers, you see it in Ezekiel, you see it uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, and you see it in the book of Revelation chapter 4. Um, I, I, when you get to chapter 28 of Ezekiel, it gives us some background on Lucifer. Um, and it says that he was the anointed cherub that covers uh, in chapter 14 and, and verse 14 of, uh, of uh, Ezekiel 28. And I know I mentioned it before, but it's worth mentioning again in all of these passages that deal with uh, Lucifer, the fall of Lucifer, uh, the devil, um, that Satan is not the equal of God, that Satan is a created being, an angel who fell away. Um, Isaiah 14 tells us, um, uh, Ezekiel 28 tells us what happened. Isaiah 14 tells us why it happened. And that's why these two uh, passages are worth, um, are, worth, uh, are worth noting. And so, um, sorry, I need to do that. People don't text me. Um, that's just the weirdest thing in the world. Like, hey, what's going on? Like, I'm in the middle of a thing here, you know. So, uh, and why aren't you at church? Anyway, so, uh, so anyway, um, but here, so Isaiah 14 tells us the motivation of why this happened, why Satan fell, and the motivation was pride. Um, but it says this, and this is, I think, just a little thing I want you to note, and that is that in uh, Ezekiel 28, it's in your notes in verse 13, is he says that, uh, God says this to him, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Now, this, that little part at the end, um, the mention of musical instruments is why many people believe that um, Lucifer was essentially in charge of all worship or singing um, in, uh, in heaven before his fall. Um, it's also the reason why um, you, one of the themes that you'll find throughout the Bible is the disdain that God has towards pride. Um, in, in Proverbs chapter 6, when it says, it gives a list of the things that the Lord hates. The top thing is pride. The thing that the Bible says that God resists is the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Because, you see, because pride is the thing that destroys people. Charles Spurgeon um, who I know many of you don't know, um, Charles Spurgeon uh, was a preacher in uh, London at a uh, church called the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Um, he, was, he's, he was called the Prince of Preachers. I mean, there, there was nobody better than this guy. Uh, my favorite book of all time was written by Spurgeon, a book that's called Lectures to My Students. Um, he had a pastor's college at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, and he would give these lectures, and thankfully someone wrote these lectures down. And uh, so we have all, all of his lectures about you know, what it means to be a pastor and serve God and serve people and teach the Bible. It's just a brilliant book, and I, I've had the pleasure of reading it several times. Um, but he said, that Spurgeon wrote this, it was the sin of pride that turned angels into devils. And um, so anyway, um, pride, no bueno. 
So, um, all right. Uh, moving on to um, the latter chapters of Ezekiel. Chapter 36 shifts uh, to the future and how God is going to bring Israel back into the land after their captivity. He also says that he's going to bring them back after an even greater scattering. Now, this is a perfect example of a near and far fulfillment. Um, he is saying, you guys have been scattered, but I'm going to bring you back. And then he says, but then I'm going to bring you back from the four corners of the globe. That's like from every possible nation, I'm going to bring you back. Well, they were just in Babylon at the time, and they were going to be coming back. But eventually, they would be coming from the four uh, from, from, all over the, from all over the planet. And so uh, this is what you see in Isaiah, or pardon me, in Ezekiel 36. It says, Son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, uh, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their uh, conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. Just to give you an idea as to how God feels about that. Uh, <laughs> So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land, because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations, and they were scattered throughout the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name, for it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, uh, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations, uh, the, na the name which you have profaned among them, the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy before your eyes, and I will take you out of the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Now, one of the things that we have seen in the last 100 years is, the Jew is Jewish people returning to the land of Israel. And um, in 1918, at the turn of the century, uh, there were 85,000 Jews living in what today is called Israel. Uh, today, there are uh, 6 million Jews living in Israel, more than any other place. Listen, there was a time like 20 years ago where there were more Jews living in New York City than there were that lived in all of the country of Israel. And that has just continued to uh, move as, as you know, Jews have just felt called to go back home uh, to Israel and do and see uh, the country flourish. And it has, been, um, it has been an amazing thing. Why? Because no people group in the history of the world has been able to maintain their national identity without a homeland. I mean, think about that. People get conquered and then they, they don't maintain their national identity. I don't know, you know, have you met any Hittites lately? Have you met any Assyrians? Have you met any, you know, Canaanites, right? Or Uptites or any, you know, you haven't. Why? But you've probably met an Egyptian. Why? Because they, why them and not the others? They're mentioned in the Bible just as these other people are mentioned. Why? Because they still have a homeland. And because they have a homeland, they've been able to maintain their national identity. Listen, no group of people has been able to go three centuries without a homeland and maintain their national identity. The Jews went 1,900 years without a homeland and kept their national identity. Why? And they'll tell you, say, how is that? And he says, uh, they'll, they'll tell you, they, um, a rabbi friend of mine says, the Jews kept the Sabbath and the Sabbath kept the Jews. Um, that's, their, that's their answer to that. Um, so he says that he's going to do that. In Ezekiel 37, um, he, uh, there's another prophecy that's given that um, God, Ezekiel is told to take two sticks, to write Judah on one and Israel on the other, and then to join the two sticks together, and that that's what God's going to do, that they will no longer be a separated nation anymore, but when they come back into the land, they're going to be a, uh, they will be one nation when they return, and they'll no longer worship idols, which is absolutely true. Now, um, that brings us to Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is, I believe, one of the most exciting prophecies uh, in the entire Bible because it hasn't happened yet. 
and we get to see the chess pieces as we watch the world. We get to see the chess pieces set up on the board. So let's, um, let's look at it um, in the first, the first couple of verses. And uh, we put in your notes um, all of the nations uh, because, you know, the nations, the, the names will change, um, but the, the land doesn't. So, um, you know, it just, you know how things are. Things get conquered. The name gets changed. Um, but the, uh, the land itself, we know what it is. So this is Ezekiel 38. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog the, in the land, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against them, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, with great army, with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, all with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of its troops, the house of Togarma uh, to the north and all of its troops, many people with you. So here's the challenge that we have. We have to identify all of these players because even though the names have changed, the area, we know what it is because the area has not, um, has, has not changed. And I think we have a map, right? We have a map of this? Okay, perfect. Um, do we have another map? A map that gives me something, give me something bigger. Give me, something, give me something bigger, like an Ezekiel 38, 39 map. Maybe that'd be something to put in a Google search, Ezekiel 38, 39 map. All right, work on that, and I'll start talking. Um, so we have the area of Gog and Magog. This is um, an area around the Black Sea. Let me know when it changes up here. Um, so, but if, you want to, if you're no, taking notes, uh, this is the area around the Black Sea. Um, so this would be kind of to the... Uh, the northwestern part of uh, Russia. Um, and so uh, this includes parts of the former Soviet Union, um, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, um, Turkmenistan, all that, parts of Afghanistan. Um, by the way, if you ever go to China and visit the Great Wall, they don't call it the Great Wall of China because that's just kind of a little self-serving, don't you think? Um, that's like, you know... they. When you go to the Middle East, they don't call it pita bread. If it's pita, they just assume it's bread. You know, so that's just, anyway, just when you be a little cultured. Um, but they don't call it, uh, the Chinese don't call it the Great Wall of China. They call it the Wall of Magog because it separated China uh, and, and Russia. How are we doing, um, how are we doing it with, on that map? No, it's not, it's not looking good. Okay. Um, all right, we'll do better. Um, I knew I was forgetting something. And uh, I just happened to forget the most important thing, the map. Uh, so uh, Rosh um, is a reference to Russia or what is modern day Russia. Uh, Meshach and Tubal, as uh, in your notes, uh, that is modern day Turkey. And um, so just to kind of do the fill-ins, uh, Persia is, uh, I mean, obviously that's Iran. Um, Ethiopia and Libya are the same, although Libya then was called uh, Kush and would have included the area of Sudan as well, um, which is important because all those guys hate Israel. Um, Gomer is, uh, is another, Turkey. Uh, Togarma is uh, the, um, Turkey and surrounding regions like Armenia. Um, and so why are they going, the, the point of the, of the issue is this. Why are they going to invade? Why do they want to invade? Let me read you this passage, and this is going to tell you why they're going to invade. Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to carry away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? There's a couple of reasons why they're going to invade. The first one is economic. Israel is a very wealthy nation. They have water. First of all, uh, which many Middle Eastern countries don't have. And one of the things when I was in Israel that I was told over and over um, was this, that in the desert, water is life. I must have been told that a hundred times when I was in Israel to understand the importance of where Israel is situated, um, uh, having just these, these, you know, the Jordan, having the Sea of Galilee, um, all that, 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 uh, that water is life. Um, that's to say nothing 
um, they, they've recently discovered um, oil, natural gas in, uh, in Israel, um, which is worth trillions. Uh, just the mineral content of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. It even is color-coded. So, uh, now by the way, I want you to look at the size of Israel. And I want you to look at the size of these people that hate Israel. Uh, this is an important thing um, to understand. That's just who's mentioned. These guys here aren't really too fond of Israel. In fact, Yemen um, is uh, literally, they, they, they are actually at war with Israel. Um, like they have, uh, they're the only people that have declared war um, on Israel. I have friends who were, um, who were missionaries in Yemen, and I was going to go visit them. And um, that, I had a problem because I have, my passport is stamped um, in Israel. And uh, so, and they, they won't, if I have been to Israel, they wouldn't let me in. Um, so anyway, um, that's that. So anyway, uh, we'll come back to this in just a minute. But uh, guys, nice job. Nice job for these guys in the back on the fly. And we want to just give a shout out to the Google. Uh, the Google is just doing, doing wonders. Uh, but the, just the minerals in the Dead Sea are valued at trillions of dollars. Uh, the, the, you, it is actually impossible to swim in the Dead Sea. I've swam in the Dead Sea, but you can't swim in the Dead Sea. All you can do is float. So you go into the, the, the water and, the first, and you just immediately go up. Because it's like it's trying to push you out because the, 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 the uh, mineral content is so high. Um, so any country that would be able to control the land of Israel um, would prosper uh, economically. Now, Let's talk a little bit about uh, religious reasons and one of the things that ties a lot of these countries um, together is um, a lot of these countries are uh, predominantly Muslim and the Islamic world is bent on destroying Israel. Um, that is because of uh, jihad. And, and once again, jihad, uh, you know, you've heard the term, the term means holy war, but jihad is also a philosophy. Um, it's a philosophy of how Islam progresses. Um, the goal of Islam is to establish Islamic authority over the entire world. But, and so because Islam teaches that Allah is the only real authority, all political systems need to be based on his teachings. And so um, Muslims believe that any land that was once occupied by Islam must remain um, in Islamic control forever. Um, and if they lose it, it has to be reconquered. And um, so when, Musl when uh, you know, the Ottoman Turks took um, Israel during the Crusades and later lost it, this is all part of the philosophy that it must be reconquered. And so to not understand that the hatred for Israel is religious in nature, it is impossible to understand the motivation of Ezekiel 38 and 39 without understanding the um, Islamic uh, influence. And uh, when we're in Revelation, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea. And uh, so um, moving on. Uh, and I know that I'm, it's, it's killing me to not go into this more. But I mean, there's literally no time. So Ezekiel 40 through 48 um, is a picture. It's one of the most um, illustrative pictures that we have of the millennium uh, we have a picture of what's called the Millennial Temple, uh, that there's going to be a new temple in the uh, thousand-year reign of Jesus on the earth. We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation 20. Um, and, and there's so much that we learn about the millennium from these, uh, from uh, uh, Ezekiel 40 through uh, 48, and we'll cover that a bit more. All right, let's get to the book of Daniel. Um, the book of Daniel is about the arrival of God, the arrival of God because there's so much about the second coming. And from a kind of 35 foot, a 35,000 foot perspective, uh, we have the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, there's several things that tell us about the future of the God's coming kingdom. Um, but Daniel's story begins and he's about 15 years old. Um, he's taken during Nebuchadnezzar's first siege of Jerusalem in 606 BC, um, Daniel and his friends are trained to, uh, they're to be trained in the ways of the Babylonians so they can serve in the court of the king. And um, at the end of this, this is, and there's a whole great story as to all this, how it goes by and Daniel's amazing integrity that we're not going to cover. 
Um, but it says this at the end of Daniel chapter 1. And as for these four young men, uh, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs uh, brought them uh, in before Nebuchadnezzar. And then the king interviewed them. And among them, none was found like Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and they served before the king. By the way, you're like, who are those three guys with Daniel? Well, if you're familiar with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those three names are their Babylonian names. Uh, these, in chapter 1, this is, these are their Hebrew names. Uh, so it's Daniel, um, who gets the name Belteshazzar, um, that, that's the king gives him that name, Belteshazzar, uh, not to be confused with Belshazzar, who we'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. Um, and then the, you know, Shadrach is um, Hananiah, uh, Meshach is Mishael, and uh, Abednego is uh, Azariah. So anyway, I like to call them by their Hebrew names just because I'm old school. So anyway, um, but they are, but the, what's important here is that it's setting up the rest of the story of what's going to happen. That uh, Daniel and his friends will serve the king by being his advisors and being one who interprets dreams. And that's what happens in the next chapter. In chapter 2, verse 1, if you'll see in your notes, now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, um, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled uh, that his sleep left him. Then the king commanded, gave a command to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and the king said to him, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, there's a couple things that I want you to know. Number one, in the first verse, it said Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and that is plural. And um, it seems like, uh, but at the end, he says, I've had a dream, uh, and I want you to tell me what it is. So what it probably is, is that God was getting Nebuchadnezzar's attention because he kept having the same dream over and over and over again. And now he can't sleep because every time he goes to sleep, he has this dream that's driving him crazy. So he calls in all the heavy hitters to tell them, I want you to tell me what the dream is. Now, if you know the story, you know that Nebuchadnezzar, they say, all right, king, tell us what the dream is. We'll tell you what it means. And he's like, oh, no. I know that game. I'm going to tell you what the game is. You're just going to make something up. If you're really worth what I'm paying you, you're going to tell me what my dream was. And then you're going to tell me what it means. And if you don't, then I'm going to have you killed and I'm going to turn your house into a dunghill. And I don't know why that's like Nebuchadnezzar's go-to thing. But every time Nebuchadnezzar has a prom, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to turn your house into a dunghill. I have no idea how many dunghills there were in Babylon, but apparently there were several. Um, based on what th this, was, this thing that was happening. So he calls in these four groups of people. There are uh, the magicians. Now, these were people um, that understood, the in Hebrew, this means they were people who understood the literature of the day. Uh, they understood the literature of the day. There were the astrologers. The astrologers were people who practiced incantations. Uh, the sorcerers were people who were experts in witchcraft. And then the Chaldeans was a general term for uh, a Babylonian. And so Chaldea was an area of Babylon. And, uh, but it, sometimes when they're called the Chaldeans, they're just referred to as, um, you know, it's just a general term. But it, you know, it refers more to these advisory or political leaders. And so, you know, he gets them together. He tells them, you're going to tell me what the dream is or, you know, you're going to, the whole dunghill thing. And so um, they're going to get killed. They tell Daniel and his buddies, they pray. And after they pray, um, God just tells Daniel what the dream is. He goes in and, and he says, and uh, the king says, are you going to tell me what the dream is? He says, well, I don't interpret dreams, but there is a God in heaven and he has made known to me what your dream is. And then I'll make known to you its interpretation. So this is the dream. And then I'll give you the, this is the interpretation. So it's in your notes. Um, in Daniel 2, it says, you, O king, were watching and behold a great image. And this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. Its form was awesome. Its, it, the image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. 
And you watched while a stone that was cut without hands struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together. And it became like the chaff uh, from the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away and no trace of them was found. And the stone was struck, that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. Uh, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the air, he has given them to your hand and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. But after there shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a, king, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks, pieces and, uh, breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. And whereas you saw feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, uh, yet the strength of the iron uh, shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And so you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but it will not adhere to one another. And just as iron does not mix with clay, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to one another. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Nebuchadnezzar is absolutely floored when he hears this because he's like, this, your God is the only God. I mean, this is an incredible thing because that is the dream and that is the interpretation. And so he is giving, um, he, Daniel is giving Nebuchadnezzar a picture of the future, of what's going to happen um, societally, what's going to happen with uh, power and the kingdoms of this world. And so the first thing that he says, and you see the rise and fall of these kingdoms, and so, and you'll see a picture here in the back, but the head of gold, Daniel says, that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold, that it represents the Babylonian Empire. One reason is because the city had tons of gold in it. Um, the Greek historian Herodotus visited the city of Babylon years later and was um, blown away by the amount of gold in the city. And that's why Babylon was called, ever since then, the Golden City. Um, in Isaiah 14, it talks about this. It says, take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say how the oppressor has ceased, the golden city ceased. So um, the, also the golden head uh, symbolized the autocratic rule of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire. Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch. He answered to no one. He did whatever he pleased. And if he didn't like you, he just killed you. There was no law that he could not supersede. There was no law that he could make. There's no law that he could make and then turn around and change it 10 minutes later because he felt like it. He had absolute control. He was an absolute monarch. Um, and from 606, um, or a little bit prior to that, but until 539 BC, Babylon ruled uh, mo much of the known world at that time. And that king ruled absolutely. At 530, in 539 BC, after that, we have um, another kingdom that comes into power, the Medo-Persians. That's why they're the arm, there's two arms, because there's the Medes and the Persians uh, that were coming together uh, for the purpose of defeating the, the Babylonians. Now, this was no longer an absolute monarchy. The king was no longer supreme. We talked about this a little bit last time in... Um, in the book of Esther, where the king made a law to, uh, to attack all the Jews that were living, that, that worshipped some strange god and didn't keep to their customs and dates and times and calendar. Um, but, and what you found is that the king could make any law that he wanted, but once that law was made, it could not be broken. 
And that's one of the phrases that you find. You find that in Daniel chapter 6 uh, with King Darius when he says that, hey, uh, they say to him, we should make a law that no one can pray only to you, king, for 30 days. He says, okay. Daniel hears that law. He opens the window so everybody can see him praying towards Jerusalem. And then it says, and anybody who does gets thrown into this, uh, this, this den of, gets thrown into this den of lions. And the king tries to change the law because he loves Daniel. And it says that it's according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be changed. So even if you're the king, you cannot change the law once it is made. Also, silver becomes the, pro the prominent currency in the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, later on, um, the belly and thighs of bronze uh, refers to the Grecian Empire led by Alexander the Great. Uh, they, uh, Alexander is the one who conquered um, the Medo-Persians, and also brass was his, the, his ch uh, metal of choice for making weapons. Um, Alexander conquered the known world at that time. He made Babylon his, uh, his capital, and um, he was an important figure because he unified the world. This is so huge. Um, he unified the world because that was his goal, was to spread Greek culture and Greek philosophy throughout the whole world. And by the time that Alexander died, um, uh, at, at, at 30 years of age, by the way, um, he was there in Babylon. He was 30 years old. He was drunk and he was weeping. And this is what he was weeping about. He said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Um, so he, um, but his goal was to spread Greek culture and philosophy. And by the time his life was over, the entire world was speaking a common language. They were all speaking Greek. Now, this is very important for us because 350 years after Alexander, Jesus shows up on the scene, the gospel begins to spread, and there's no language barrier because everyone is speaking Greek, and that's why the gospel was able to spread so quickly was because the entire known world was speaking the same language. And so, and this guy was so driven um, to, uh, to conquer the world, and little did he know he was serving God's purpose of getting the world to speak one language so the gospel could spread. Um, after Alexander, um, which later, uh, Alexander died, and uh, he had no heir, um, and uh, so it was pretty much a couple hundred years of his four generals that were fighting, and um, uh, there's, you know, if you read, um, there's some of that mentioned, like in uh, uh, chapters um, 8, 10, 11, of, uh, especially 10 and 11, chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Daniel, it's talking a lot about that. Um, if you read uh, the book, the apocryphal books um, uh, that are in the Catholic Bible, not in the Protestant Bible, these are books that we don't believe that are inspired. But um, if you read the books of Maccabees, it, it's talking about that period of time um, that during the, uh, the, the reign of these, you know, uh, these four generals um, that, were, that were trying all for them because they, they were standing over Alexander at his deathbed and they said, who, do you, who is your heir? Who do you give the kingdom to? And his last words were, give it to the strong. And so that just set everybody off. And uh, everybody is warring again for a couple hundred years. Like, dude, a little direction would have helped, uh, would have saved some lives. Um, but anyway, um, after that comes uh, the Roman Empire, who are the legs of iron. There's two legs because there were uh, two um, capitals. The, the Roman Empire was split into two um, the east and the west, uh, Rome being the central city in the west, Constantinople being the central city uh, in the east. Uh, the reason why it's uh, their legs of iron, because iron is the most powerful of all these metals, and the Roman Empire was brutal. Uh, they coined a phrase that was called Pax Romana, uh, which meant Roman peace. And what that meant was is that they were going to beat you into submission, and that's how everybody had peace. And um, that was at least their version of peace anyway. So... Um, now, why does God allow Rome to rise to power? Now, here's what Rome did best. Rome conquered the known world at that time. Um, and uh, I don't know if you ever heard the phrase that all roads lead to Rome. Uh, the, re the reason for that phrase is because the thing that Rome did best was build a road system. And they built a road system so that no matter where you were, you could make it to the center of life and culture and power and empire, which was the city of Rome. And so the, the Romans paved roads all over the empire. Um, some of those, those roads are still in use. Um, when I was in Israel several years ago, 
um, our bus pulled over um, and, and kind of like just on a random, like uh, kind of a major road, and it, our bus pulled over because there was a whole stretch of road um, that was the original uh, Roman road. And if uh, you're familiar with the story in the book of Acts of, um, you know, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, um, that was, it, it was, it was right around there. And uh, anyway, we had a, a lot of fun. I did a whole teaching on that um, with uh, a whole bunch of college students. It was great. And then we took pictures like old school roads. Anyway, that was fun. Um, but the, the, the point is, is that when Jesus is born and the disciples are charged to get the gospel out to all the ends of the earth, they use the, Rome, the, the, the roads that Rome built and the language that Alexander had uh, put all over, uh, all over the earth. And so this is um, the, uh, you know, so that's why the Bible says in Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. The entire world was speaking the same language, and the entire world was connected uh, with this intricate road system that could get the gospel out quickly. And that's why Christianity spread so quickly, because the conditions were right for it to happen. Um, then it says that there are a uh, feet mixed with, uh, uh, or that is feet of iron mixed with clay. Now there is, uh, this is the part that's yet future. Uh, and what many scholars believe, this is a confederation of nations that is yet to take place, uh, partly of iron, and that's why it is believed that it is a reviving of the Roman Empire, because it's the legs of iron. Um, but meaning that this is going to be a, um, a confederacy of nations located in, in the western part of Rome, because listen, um, Rome fell. Uh, in the 4th century, Rome was invaded and sacked by the Visigoths, uh, and that was kind of the end of the Roman Empire in Rome. The west, that is the eastern part of the Roman Empire. The western part of the Roman Empire endured another thousand years. And, uh, and so anyway, um, the, the point of this is Daniel says that this is, uh, th this, this kingdom, um, this is, it's different. It says in the days of those kings, he doesn't say the kingdom. It says in the days of those kings, that's why uh, it's iron mixed with clay because they're partially strong and they're partially weak. And that's why it says that there, uh, then there's a stone that's cut without hands, crashes into the image at the feet, at, at the iron mixed with clay, and that God is then establishing his kingdom on the earth, which lasts forever. Neb Nebuchadnezzar freaks out when he hears that, and he's like, you are the only true God. And then that's until chapter 3. Uh, I don't know if I put that in your notes, in chapter 3, verse 1. Was that in your notes? And Listen to chapter 3, verse 1. So, God is the only, you know, Yahweh is the only God, you know, Jehovah is the only God, Daniel, your God is the best. And, uh, and then it says this in chapter 3, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits. Now, a cubit, by the way, if you read that in the Bible, uh, a cubit is the distance from your elbow to the top of your middle finger. So it's about 18 inches. Um, and that's how that was, you know, people didn't have tape measures back then, unfortunately. So they would measure things based on how many cubits it was from the, uh, the, your elbow to the top of your uh, middle finger. And then, so this is, um, it was 60 cubits high. It's 90 feet high and nine feet wide. Now, just to give you a little understanding of how big this statue is, if you've, how many of you have been to the, Link, the uh, Lincoln Memorial in Washington? Okay, the Lincoln Memorial is 19 feet high. Okay. This is three and a half times taller than that. I mean, this is a humongous uh, thing. What is Nebuchadnezzar doing by building a statue that's entirely of gold? He's saying, I know what God says, that my kingdom is eventually going to be swept away, and all that's left is going to be God's kingdom, but I am saying that my kingdom will never fall. That's why it's solid gold. And there's an amazing story in the fiery furnace, and you know we're not covering that, um, which leads to Nebuchadnezzar going crazy in chapter 4. And I'm realizing I'm, I'm just about out of time. If you give me five minutes, I'll cover uh, the very end and, and, we'll, and we'll be done. Is that cool? All right. If you have to go, it's okay. You can just walk out. That's all right. I, I'll still, you know, I'll, I'll harbor a little bit of resentment, but that's it. Um, all right. So we'll go quick. Um, so I want to talk about uh, Daniel chapter 5 because this is part of, the, uh, part of the Bible history and this is part of the fall of Babylon. Um, Belshazzar is now king. Well, um, let me take that back. Um, Belshazzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar dies, and um, he gives the kingdom to 
uh, his son who dies, and then he ends up giving his kingdom to the, his son-in-law, uh, who was uh, the husband of his daughter, whose name is Nabonidus. Nabonidus becomes the king of Babylon, but he's not really interested in ruling. So he just goes off and leaves his son in charge. His son's name is Belshazzar, um, and he just goes off and adventures in Africa and all these places, you know, who knows what he's doing. And um, now, when Babylon finally falls, Nabonidus hasn't been to the city of Babylon in 14 years. So this, you want to talk about a leader who is disengaged from what's happening in his kingdom. He's the guy. Um, well, Belshazzar uh, in chapter 5 is having a huge party for a thousand of his nobles. Some of this was in defiance to the Medo-Persian army, which had been uh, doing a siege around the city of Jerusalem. Him throwing a party was his way of saying that this army outside of our walls is inconsequential. Now, history records that the previous, in the previous four months, the Medes and the Persians had conquered all of the surrounding towns and villages around the city of Babylon. By the way, that's why a thousand of his lords are hanging out in the city. Their towns have already been conquered, and they're finding refuge within the city of Babylon. Now, the second reason is kings would often do this, but when kings would conquer a people group, they would bring the statues out of the gods that they conquered and put it in the, the temple or, or the, the area where, you know, they'd have a party and like, oh, let's bring out the statue of the God that these people worshiped because, you know, that God apparently didn't help them. The problem is, um, and that, by the way, that was to show that the God Marduk, who, was, um, who the Babylonians worship, was greater than all other gods. But the Jewish people weren't allowed to make graven images. Um, so there weren't any images of the Jewish God. So Belshazzar says, we'll bring out all the holy vessels that were used in the temple in Jerusalem and we'll just like drink our beers and whatever um, out, of, out of that um, in defiance to the God that we conquered. So here's, um, this is in Daniel chapter five, verse three. It says, and they had brought out the golden vessels which had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and his kings and lords, wives and concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. And the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw part of the hand that wrote, and the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. Now, when it says that the writing appears and his hips were loosened, that's a very nice way of saying he should have been wearing a diaper. All right, this guy is really uh, very freaked out of what's, what's happening and he tries to find someone who can interpret the writing. Well, the queen regent, basically his mother, the queen regent says, uh, Belshazzar, don't worry. There is a man in your kingdom who is of the people who were carried away from Jerusalem, um, who when your father, Nebuchadnezzar, or technically grandfather, because we talked about that, um, that there's no word in Hebrew for grandfather, there's only father. So when he says your father, Nebuchadnezzar, um, to every, every, your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather, they're all your father in that culture. Anyway, um, he says, but there's a man that can, um, he can interpret dreams. So call him. So they call Daniel and he comes in and then Daniel just really breaks this guy off. And he just tells him, you know, your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a real king. He was awesome. God gave him power and authority and you're basically a punk. Um, that's, that's Bob International version. Um, but anyway, so, so now this is what uh, this is Daniel's interpretation. This is uh, in your notes in Daniel chapter 5. It says, Then the fingers of the hand which were sent to him, uh, and this writing was written, and the inscription was written, Meeny, meeny, miny, mo. No. Uh, meeny, me. I love that joke. Uh, meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsen. And the interpretation, this is the interpretation of each word. Meeny, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Uh, Perez, uh, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And then Belshazzar gave the command. They clothed Daniel in purple, put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation that he should be a third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being 62 years old. Now, one thing I want you to notice, the thing that 
um, he, uh, Belshazzar tells Daniel is that, hey, if you can interpret this, I will make you a third ruler in the kingdom. Because once again, Nabonidus was the king and then um, uh, Belshazzar was the regent. So he's like, if you can do this, we'll be like this triumvirate together, the three of us, and we'll have each, you know, a third part of the kingdom. And Daniel says, listen, I want no part of it. I don't want to be the captain of the Titanic because this thing is all going down tonight. And so Daniel becomes, you know, uh, history's first cryptographer, and he interprets the words that are written and tells Daniel what they mean. Um, Mini is, is a or Aramaic word, which means numbered. Uh, Tekel, an Aramaic word that means um, weighed. And then Eupharsin is the plural of Paris and means divided. And um, he's telling uh, Belshazzar that his time is up and that his kingdom has been given. And that very night, uh, Darius the Mede, or uh, also goes by Cyrus the Persian, they had been besieging the city of Babylon for months. And on October 12, 539 BC, history records, the Babylonian kingdom came to an end. Um, chapters 1 through 6 of Daniel are, are the narrative part. They're the story of Daniel and his life throughout his career in Babylon. Chapters 7 through 12 are the prophecies of the book. Chapter 7 is a vision that Daniel gets of four beasts that match the four uh, metals in uh, the statue. Chapter 8 talks about the rise of the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. It also talks about the characteristics of the uh, future character we call Antichrist. We'll talk about him later. Um, chapter 9 talks about the coming Messiah, the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, chapters 10 and 11 give us a great glimpse into the spiritual realm, um, into what happens when we fast and pray, and also later on gives us uh, some history of the... Um, what happens in that intertestamental period when the four generals of um, uh, Alexander are just going at it for like 200 years. And then chapter 12 is really about the end times and how the book of Daniel will be closed until the end. And it's really only in the end that people will start to understand it. Listen, it's really only in the last 100 years that people have really started to understand the book of Daniel. Um, in chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will increase. Um, that's the major difference between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Both are prophetic in nature, um, but Revelation is an open book. The word revelation means to reveal or to unveil. And so Revelation is all about revealing what God is going to do in the future. Um, you know, I, I, every time I've taught Revelation, and I've taught it a couple of times here at Calvary, I taught it a couple times at the college level, and I've, my first day, it's always the same. There is not one shred of new information in the book of Revelation. Um, there are over 800 illusions and references to the Old Testament. The writer of Revelation is expecting you to be an Old Testament expert. Um, and, that, and if you are an expert in the Old Testament, you will read Revelation and be like, well, that makes sense. Because he's just taking everything that the Old Testament talked about in different places and puts it in chronological order as to what's going to happen. Daniel, on the other hand, is a sealed book. And that's what the angel uh, tells Daniel in verse 4. Seal it until the time of the end. How do you know you're, you're at the time of the end? Uh, many will run to and fro, and knowledge will increase exponentially. And um, listen, people running to and fro can be people searching to and fro to understand Bible prophecy or people physically traveling everywhere. And I mean, obviously both could be the case. But listen, we are traveling faster than at any other rate that we thought possible. Do you understand a couple of years ago, Red Bull shot a guy out from space? Like, seriously, this is what, these people just make sodas and they're shooting a guy out of a missile from space. Like, okay, Pete, we can all say that, yeah, I think the Bible's, per, that, that, People are moving to and fro. I think we can all say that's happening. A guy who came from outer space and he was home for dinner that night. And so um, it also says that knowledge will increase. And this isn't like what people say, you know, you learn something new every day. That's not what that means. It means that there will be the exponential increase of knowledge. Now, let me show you this graph. Um, from Jesus, the time of Jesus to the year 1500, this was the collective amount of knowledge that we, we had up until that time. Knowledge doubled again from 1500 to 1750. Knowledge doubled again from 1750. So it, went, it was 1500 years, 250 years, and 150 years, 
In 50 years, it doubled again, and now knowledge is doubling every 12 months. Encyclopedias are out of date before they are even printed. That's how fast, which is the reason why uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, after 244 years, stopped producing um, encyclopedias in 2010 because they, they knew it. They, every time we print something, by the time we print it and produce it, it's already out of date. And listen, think about this. There is more information in one copy of the New York Times than a normal person in the 19th century. There's more information in one copy of the New York Times than one person in the 19th century was exposed to in his, in his or her entire life. Knowledge is increasing at an exponential rate. And what does that mean? It means that this time is upon us. And listen, do you want to know something? And I, I think about this, that you know that God didn't pick, I mentioned Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers. God didn't pick Charles Spurgeon to be part of his last day's church. God didn't pick um, whoever your Bible hero is um, to be part of his last day church. You know who he picked to be part of his last day church? You. He picked you to be part of his last day's church, the church that's going to be here when Jesus comes back. And I firmly believe the more that I study Bible prophecy, the more that I see the conditions of the world, that what Jesus said is right, that he is coming, and he's coming quickly. And what does that mean for us? That means that we've got to put God first. That means that we need to live in light of eternity. That means we need to make spiritual growth a, a priority in our lives. And that, I'm talking, you know, that... Um, and I realize I'm preaching to the choir, those of you guys that are here on Wednesday night, but it's like, we just take it seriously. We make study a priority, God's word a priority, us knowing God's word, hiding it in our heart, investing in God's kingdom a priority. That all of it, listen, that because where our treasure is, there our, our heart is, that when we put the things of God first, the things of God will be the things that we care about most. And listen, people... Who believe, you know, there are people who lived in previous generations that believed that Jesus was coming back, and it, they turned out not to be right, that, that Jesus is coming back, but he didn't come back in their lifetime. But you know, there is one characteristic of people that believe Jesus was coming back previously, um, because Jesus is coming back in everybody's lifetime. He's either coming back for you personally uh, when you go to heaven, uh, or he's going to come back when he actually comes back in his, in his second coming. But listen, everyone who actually lives who, who lived like they believed Jesus was coming back is someone who finished well. They finished well with their family. They finished well in their relationships. They finished well in their community and what God called them to do. They served God in their generation. And listen, so when we believe and hide in our heart and live like Jesus is coming back, our lives are better for it. The kingdom of God is better for it. Our church is better for it when we start living like it. Let's pray together. And Lord, we want to thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the promise that you are coming quickly and we believe that you are. And we pray the prayer that Christians have prayed for thousands of years, the prayer, Maranatha, uh, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And so we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing here at Calvary. And we pray, Lord, for this community that we might see um, the thousands of people in this community uh, come to know you, to be saved, to see uh, bro broken families come together, broken hearts mended, broken lives restored by the power of the gospel, by the power of your spirit, and by the amazing work that you want to do in your church, God. And I pray you would use Calvary and the people who call Calvary home, this congregation, to do that amazing work. We pray it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen.